application for community and matter of standards and protection, LLP, and other Good afternoon. Uh, are these, these not look like the usual microphones that should be shoved in my face yet. Are they needed for the transcriber, for a transcriber, for the transcriber? Okay, I'll turn them back again. Where is that? Got two. Can you hear? Good. Um, yes. My Lord, uh, I appear for the appellant with Mr. Simon Paul, Mr. Philip E. D. King's Council, Mr. Luke Pierce, King's Council, and Mr. Sam Pitts uh, appear for the first and third uh, respondents. Uh, Mr. Gerard and Mr. Black are not participating actively in this appeal. Um, my Lord, did, I know you said we should leave over the issue of the time estimate to this. To this yes, we, 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 we've now been in the position to give it some thought. We're um, uh, happy. Of course, the court is always happy if the um, case doesn't take quite as long as council estimate. But if the estimate for which you provided turns out to be realistic, that's fine by us. So you've got up to um, Wednesday to close of play. Um, my Lord, just one housekeeping matter. The transcriber has very kindly said she doesn't require a break. Maybe others do, but if, if we can. Without one. I don't see any reason why we should have a break, but I'm glad that the transcriber doesn't need one. Thank you. Uh, and I imagine we'll be getting daily transcripts at the end of the day, and usual, or at the end of the day, but as soon as possible after the hearing. It's often quite useful for us to know when we'll be getting them. Thank you. Um, just one other uh, matter uh, to confirm what I think is already sufficiently clear that we are not going to hear the fresh evidence application. Uh, separately, and we either will read or um, will have read, so far as necessary, the uh, fresh evidence on a Deveni essay basis. You will obviously have to build into your submissions anything you want to say. Um, uh, you will have seen the um, hint I dropped in my judgment, or you remember it, that um, uh, it's up to you, of course, but you may not want to um, spend a lot of time trying to persuade me on one aspect of the, uh, uh, effectively on the question of delay. Yeah. But up to you, um, but you'll need to deal with it at some point in your submission. Thank you, my lord. Um, my lord, this appeal in a nutshell uh, is that the defendants have not applied the correct principles when making their privilege determinations for the purposes of withholding production of documents on disclosure, and nor have they provided adequate evidence to make good the claims of privilege. And on that basis, we say that the judge erred in rejecting all of the privilege, the main privilege challenges made by Mr. al Sadek. I say the main privilege challenge, challenges because there were some minor points, such as redactions, which are no longer pursued on this appeal. Uh, and we say this proposition that the principles were applied incorrectly by the defendants is reinforced by the further evidence, which is the subject of the uh, application before the court. The defendants make much of the fact that this was a very complicated and involved disclosure exercise, and that they, or rather their solicitors, have given very careful and rigorous consideration to it, and you'll have seen the references in Miss Allen's ninth witness statement to that. But my lords, no matter how anxious the scrutiny given by Mr. Allen and his team, it doesn't in the end take the defendants anywhere if they have erred in their application of the law or have put forward inadequate evidence to make good the privilege claims. Now, I'd ask your Lordship to note that unlike many cases where similar challenges are made, the privilege that we are concerned with is not the privilege of the party to the proceedings, but of a third party, which is entirely absent. Uh, I will come to the fact that they have had some involvement in the disclosure process, but they are absent. Now. I don't think I need to spend much time uh, uh, addressing you on the singular nature of this case. It hardly needs to be said it's not a vanilla case. The facts are highly unusual, indeed extreme. Obviously, it is no part of this appeal to prejudge the allegations that are being made against the defendants. They are obviously to be determined at trial. However, understanding the case that is being advanced by Mr. Al-Sadek is essential when considering the issues of privilege 
which arise on this appeal. <coughs> now, a critical part of that understanding is appreciating the context for the human rights abuses which Mr. Al Sadek alleges were perpetrated against him. And at its heart, Mr. Al Sadek's case is that the defendant's clients, and I, by that I include the ruler, employed a strategy, the aim of which was to obtain material to harm Dr. Mossad. And the vendetta against Dr. Mossad was bound up with the ruler's political struggle with his brothers. And that strategy of the ruler included extracting information from Mr. Al Sadek that would be useful in the investigation into Dr. Mossad. And that, of course, is the investigation in which the defendants were instructed. And we say it is that impetus to extract information which gave rise to the human rights abuses against Mr. Al Sadek that are alleged in these proceedings. And, and it's for that reason we say Mr. Al Sadek was effectively collateral damage in the ruler's aim to bring down Dr. Mossad. And you, you will have seen that's all pleaded in the particulars of claim, paragraphs 11 to 29, supplementary bundle, tab 11, pages 206 to 210. Now, linked to this point that the collateral... Can I just mention something Sorry. I meant to mention? I think it would be useful for us to have in soft copy um, the uh, complete uh, pleadings in their um, eventual form. I see why you are obviously very voluminous, why you didn't copy them all in hard copy. But could that be attended to? Yes, yes. We, uh, we will do that. Thank but you. The, the, well, the passages you've just referred to are among the passages. They are. That they copy. They are that. Yeah. But you're right. There are others I'll be referring to that unfortunately are. Um, it, it, so um, it is also part of Mr. Alphabet's case, and this is linked to the point that he was collateral damage in the ruler's vendetta against Dr. Mossad. It's part of his case that the investigation was not confined to uh, simply investigating alleged frauds of Dr. Mossad but it, in fact, went much further. It had PR aspects, it had political objectives, seeking to undermine Dr. Mossad in whatever way possible, including with respect to his business interests. It incorporated matters that had nothing to do with investigating alleged frauds or seeking to ascertain issues of legal liability. And we say that the the fact that the investigation didn't have that narrow compass of a fraud investigation is given significant support by the further evidence. Now, I'd also like to draw the court's attention to the very singular nature of the evidence uh, made in support of the privilege claims in this appeal. All of the evidence on the defendant's side is in the form of witness statements from Mr. Allen partner at Enyo Law with con conduct of this case, the first and third defendants. Now, on one view, there is nothing unusual that on an interlocutory application, one receives evidence from solicitor instructed on the case. However, the fact that we only have the evidence from Mr. Allen is highly significant in the circumstances of this case, because Mr. Allen is twice removed from the subject matter. He is not a representative of the privilege holder. He is not even the solicitor of the privilege holder. He is the solicitor of the solicitors of the privilege holder. And I'd also like to uh, draw attention in this context that not only are the RAC entities and the ruler the putative privilege holders, but they are also the parties who are alleged to have perpetrated the human rights abuses. And yet nowhere in Mr. Allen's evidence do you see him providing information or evidence which is said to be based on instructions that he has received from Deckard's clients. Now, we do not accept, if the point is taken, that Deckard is in any practical difficulties here because, for example, they don't have access anymore to their former clients. We know uh, that the former clients have their own legal representation through Allen and Overy, and we know that Mr. Uh, from Mr. Allen's evidence... So you say former clients, I should have picked this up, that deference don't act for any of the RAC entities or the ruler in any respect? I think that's correct. That's correct. Um, we know from Mr. Allen's evidence that ENU are in close contact with Allen and Overy because they took part in some of the privileged determinations. You see Mr. Allen refer to that at paragraph 20 of his third statement 
supplementary bundle, tab 4, page 97. So instructions could have been obtained from them. And yet, a decision has been made not to provide any evidence of that sort. I'm going to return to this theme in due course, but just to give you two examples uh, at this juncture of the conspicuous hole that that generates in the evidence. On litigation privilege, there is no evidence of any sort from Deckert's clients on when and how they contemplated the litigation in respect of which privilege is claimed. Given that they are the parties, not Deckert, who need to have contemplated the relevant litigation, that is, we say, unsatisfactory and inadequate, uh, so far as the legal requirements for making out any claim for litigation privilege are concerned. So that's one hole. The other is on the iniquity exception. We have no evidence at all from the defendant's clients, despite the admitted contact between them during this litigation. We have no evidence from them seeking to rebut any of the allegations on human rights abuses. Can I just, uh, before I turn to the, to the meat and uh, start, I'm going to deal first with the iniquity exception. Can I just say a few words on the further evidence? I'm grateful for uh, my Lord, uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor's indication, sorry, the uh, Vice President's indication that I can treat it that the court will read this De Bene essay. And what I propose to do is to refer to the further evidence in the context of the three main grounds uh, of, of appeal as I go through there. And that will address uh, the relevance and importance of that evidence. Uh, my Lords already have our supplementary skeleton as well, dealing with that at tab 10 of the further evidence bundle, page 161. Um, you will have seen that the defendants have also put in a further skeleton uh, on that issue of the, uh, they say, alleged non-importance of the uh, further evidence, but they have also served a witness statement, Mr. Allen's 17th witness statement, in which they uh, say that in the light of the further evidence, uh, and you have taken, done and undertaken a further review uh, of the documents, and they have now disclosed an extract of a document previously redacted on grounds of legal advice privilege and mitigation privilege, which they acknowledge in the light of the further evidence is now caught by the iniquity exception. Um, I, I will come back to that, but we say that, that extra piece of disclosure raises many more questions and casts yet further doubt on the defendant's approach. Now, the defendants continue to resist the admission of this further evidence. They say it shouldn't be admitted because it's too late, and also that the evidence would have no real impact. We say that it is unreal to suggest this evidence would not have had any impact, would not have had any impact below. <coughs> the evidence shows a number of things. First of all, extensive unlawful hacking by the defendant's clients, which took place over a period of years, generating numerous reports. Those reports provide compelling evidence that the investigation that was commissioned by the defendant's clients was not simply an investigation into alleged frauds of Dr. Massad that went much wider. Mr. Gerard, at least, was involved in and received the fruits of the hacking, and indeed we've cited one example in Mr. Chatelou's witness statement of him using material from that report, very clear inference we suggest, using material in his questioning uh, of Mr. al -Sadek. And we know uh, from an email uh, that my Lord uh, the Vice President will remember, an email where Mr. Gerard talks about wanting to protect communications and legal professional privilege. So we say that evidence shows that Mr. Gerard was instrumental in trying to put uh, into place arrangements so that the communications with these investigative agents uh, employed to do the hacking would be somehow covered by legal professional privilege. That's all just the hacking. The further evidence also demonstrates that Mr. Gerard perjured himself at the Azima trial and that he was responsible for concocting a false story for Rakia as to how it came into possession of hacked material. Now that m material, my lords, puts a completely different complexion on Deckett's retainer. And it is plain, we say, that it would have affected the evaluation of each aspect of the uh, privilege application that we made. And the further evidence is also significant because it reinforces the perception 
that the respondents have erred in their approach to privilege. In particular, they have taken an impermissibly narrow approach to what constitutes in furtherance of the purpose, purposes of the iniquity exception. Uh, so, well, that's effectively my introduction. Just so you can follow where I'm going, I'm going to now address the three main grounds of appeal, the iniquity exception, which I suspect will take me the rest of the day, uh, and then tomorrow, litigation privilege and legal advice privilege. And as I said, I'll, I will address you on the further evidence in the course of addressing those grounds, and in such a way, I hope, that if at the end of the day you decide the evidence shouldn't be admitted, it will be easy to excise my submissions on those points, because I will deal with them in a self-contained way. As for the other considerations of the further evidence application, uh, the other criteria, why in particular the court should exercise its discretion to admit the evidence, uh, I will deal with those as far as necessary at the end of my submissions, time permitting, or in reply. But I would say that the, we rely on what we set out in our skeleton in support of our application in the further evidence bundle at tab 8, page 576. My lords, I don't intend to address the court separately on our fourth ground of uh, uh, appeal, delay. Uh, in essence, we say that is simply supportive of the other grounds, and it provides a further reason for why it is appropriate for this court <coughs> to examine the evidence which was before the judge and to make its own assessment. So, my lords, ground one, the iniquity exception. And uh, here is how I propose to address you on this ground. I'm going to deal very briefly with Mr. al Sadek's case on the alleged iniquities, then address you on the law, uh, and then the evidence, and then uh, uh, the final part will be uh, addressing you on the proposed formulation for capturing the communications if you are satisfied that the evidential burden is satisfied. So, uh, briefly, Mr. al -Sadek's case. As my lords know, uh, we are concerned with three types of iniquity. Abduction and un un unlawful detention. Detention in conditions amounting to torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. And denial of access to legal representation. Uh, now, so far as all of those three categories of conduct are concerned, the defendants accept that such conduct, if established, would amount to iniquity for the purposes of the exception. So I do not need to trouble your lordships on any law as to what amounts to iniquity. Now, while these are relied on as distinct categories of iniquity, they are all reflective of, we submit, the same overarching purpose namely to procure Mr. al Sadek's cooperation with the investigation being conducted by Deckert, and in particular his cooperation in providing evidence against Dr. Massad. Now can I just at this point pick up a point that is taken in my learned friend's skeleton with what they say at paragraph 52, it's uh, full bundle tab 4, page 88. Page numbering changed, I think, on the replacement versions. I, uh, but if my lords have, it's paragraph. Well, give us the paragraph number. 52. 52. 50 sub 2. So that's 53 in, in the hard. Wait, hang on. Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong. 50 sub 2 or 52? <laughs> 50 sub 2 is 87. Um, yes, 50 sub 2 is correct, and then over the page 88. Now what they say uh, is, um, they say that um, our evidence expressly disavows any attempt 
show who was responsible for the alleged inequities or what their purpose was, and that in fact Mr. Al Sadek's evidence doesn't even attempt to make these propositions good. That is, that. Um, Hang on one second. I have to look more carefully. So the, the assumptions they say our case proceeds on are set out at 52 in A and B, namely that Deckett's former clients were responsible for the commission of the alleged inequities, and two, the purpose of those inequities was to enable the respondents to extract information or evidence. Yes, I see. Sorry. Yes, I just. And they, they say, um, they take issue uh, with that and say, well, you disavowed any attempt to show who was responsible for the alleged inequities uh, or what their purpose was, and indeed your evidence doesn't even attempt to make those propositions good. Now, my lords, that is wrong. All Mr. Al Sadek disavowed uh, below and continues to now is attempting to show that the defendants were responsible for the iniquities. That's Mr. Chatterloo's sixth statement, paragraph 52, supplementary bundle, tab 2, page 31. Sorry, let me have the reference again. Sorry, Chatterloo 6, yep. paragraph 52, supplementary bundle, tab 2, page 31. And, and the reason we, we uh, disavowed that was because we said, well, um, Mr. Arsadek doesn't need to prove that the defendants were involved at all to make good the challenge. So that is true. We disavowed that. But our evidence on this application has always made clear that Mr. Arsadek's case was that the ruler was responsible for the iniquities. And the evidence was uh, below and here and here on this appeal is relied upon to make that good. I'm going to return to that when I come to address you on the evidence, but I'll just ask you to, to, to mark that in, uh, in my learned friend's skeleton, that that is not correct. And there is uh, plenty of evidence which I will be taking you to, uh, which shows that we did indeed put forward a, a lot of evidence to explain the ruler's uh, involvement and responsibility for those iniquities. Can I turn then to the law? Your pleading seems to be full of allegations that um, Deckert, including Mr. Gerard, um, were responsible for and exercised control over yes. the same matters as you refer to as iniquities for the purpose of privilege. My, my lord, that, my lord is right. And that are ma those are matters that are going to be have to be determined at trial. But my point is, for the purpose of the privilege application, your lordships don't need to get into that and but make any findings. And indeed, you might, might properly consider that's not right to be making any findings about what Deckert's responsibility is, because that is a matter for trial. Uh, and my point is that this is one of those privilege applications where uh, it isn't necessary to try and uh, to prejudge any of those issues, because my uh, challenge on the iniquity application doesn't require you to make any such findings. Precisely. Thank you. Um, so, my lords, the law. Uh, uh, and I'm going to, if I may, deal with this in three points. First of all, uh, to address you on the test for the inequity exception and how it is to be applied. Secondly, again, on the law, what needs to be proved by Mr. al -Sadek. And then, uh, thirdly, consideration of some of the key authorities to make good my submissions on those first two propositions. So first of all, the test and how it is to be applied. Can I start with some common ground? There is agreement as to the framing of the test and how it is described and explained in the authorities. And you'll have seen both of our skeleton arguments referring to the fact that the exception applies to communications which are part of or in furtherance of the iniquity. And my learned friends accept that the expression in furtherance of includes a communication which, quotes, affects the accomplishment the iniquity. That is paragraph 37 of their skeleton, page uh, 84 of the uh, core bundle. Hang on one second. In further, in the phrase in furtherance of encompasses what? Uh, it it in, includes a communication which affects the accomplishment. That's effects. Affects. Sorry. Affects. Affects the accomplishment of the iniquity. I'm going to come, it comes up in um, Cox and Wells, and I'm going to take you to that in a minute. Uh, but, but and where, where will I find that in the skeleton? Uh, paragraph 37 
of the respondent's skeleton. Thank you. But we also agree on both sides of the court uh, that the decision of my, uh, my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell in Elbiaza provides the touchstone, and that you also find in the respondent's skeleton, paragraph 40, page 84 of the bundle. Can I then turn to where we disagree? There is a fundamental disagreement as to what in furtherance of actually entails when one comes to consider uh, communications and documents, and hence what the scope of the exception is and how it applies in this case. But we, of course, say that the respondent's approach is impermissibly narrow, and they say ours is far too wide. Um, if, if I may, I'd like to examine a little further how they say it should be interpreted. And whilst they do refer in their skeleton to the in furtherance uh, uh, criterion, the essence of the test that they have adopted is set out in their skeleton, paragraph 42, page 85 of the bundle. And that's uh, uh, what we've termed in our skeleton, well, I think in both skeletons, is the Barrow Fen formulation. And my lords want to, may want to remind yourselves of that. It's probably just you don't need to look up the authority. You have my learned friends have cited the passage uh, in the Deputy Judge's judgment uh, at paragraph 85 of their skeleton. Now you, you'll see that there it says, at the beginning of the quotation, the iniquity exception broadly states that privilege may not be inserted, asserted, sorry. In relation to documents which were brought into Sorry, it, where are you reading from? At the top of 85 of my learned friend Skeleton, where he's quoting from uh, Mr. Allen's. Yes, uh, okay, no, no, I have it, I have it. And, and, it's, and that's taken, I think, that he's uh, taken that there from a, a direct quote from Barrowfin. So, documents which were brought into existence for the purpose of furthering a criminal or fraudulent purpose. Now, you'll see here there's two references to purpose in that quotation. And my submission, there are two ways of treating this formulation. Either you can say it's an impermissible narrowing of the exception, and therefore sh shouldn't be used or followed, or it has to be read and construed in a way that it doesn't undermine the case law. Now, the reason I say that uh, one view is to say it's an impermissible narrowing of the exception is because these words are rather different to what Lord Sumner used in O'Rourke. Um, and you'll see that in my learned friend's skeleton if you just turn back a page to page 84, paragraph 38. And there Lord Sumner talked about documents which have been brought into existence. I'm sure you're going to take us to O'Rourke Properly later, are you? Yes. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, I'm just doing this by way of... No, I understand. No, no, I just open. wanted to be sure. Yes. Okay. Um, so documents which have been brought into existence in the course of or in furtherance of. So one might ask, well, if, if that formulation is, is broader, in my submission, or certainly could be read as being broader, brought into existence in the course of, rather than what uh, the Deputy Judge said in Barrowton, brought into existence for the purpose of. Now, let, let's look a little bit more closely. My learned friends say Barofin is an entirely acceptable uh, formulation, uh, and, and therefore it must, in my submission, be read in such a way that it's consistent with the existing case law. Now, what in particular does the first reference to purpose mean? It cannot mean with the creator of the communication having that aim. Because if it second. did... Hang on one second. Yep. It, it, it cannot mean with the creator of the communication having that aim, that first reference to purpose, because if it did, it wouldn't catch the innocent solicitor communications. And if it, that is what it means, then it's wrong and contrary to the authority. And, and uh, I must say that the respondents have confirmed they do not understand Barofen to be saying that. So we're all agreed that that first reference to purpose cannot mean with the creator of the communication having that aim. But if that's 
right, and it has to stand with the existing case law, it, it must just mean a communication which somehow has the effect of furthering the iniquitous purpose in a way that promotes or assists or somehow facilitates the overarching iniquitous purpose in some way. So the communication could, from the author's perspective, have a purpose which isn't iniquitous, but is nevertheless caught because its effect is to somehow further the overarching iniquitous purpose. Or, adopting Lord Sumner's expression in O'Rourke, it could simply be a communication that is made in the course of a fraud or iniquity. But my lord, if, if that is the correct reading, then this formulation really just collapses down back into what's used in most other authorities, into communications made in furtherance of an iniquitous purpose. So those initial words where, where the deputy judge uses purpose, to my submission, can just be ignored because they add nothing. Now, my lords, part of the difficulty on this part of the appeal is trying to understand how exactly the defendants have applied the test set out in that formulation, and indeed why they're sticking to it so assiduously. Now, as I've said, they accept that the test doesn't require the author of the document to have an iniquitous purpose. They also say, in their skeleton at paragraph 49.2, page 87, they say that they considered the purpose of both Deckett's clients and the defendants. But what does that actually mean, and how did they consider Really where, where do they say that? Page 49, uh, sorry, to paragraph 49 to page 87, and it's referring to Mr. Allen's evidence. Yes, but where, where they said they considered the evidence of both. Uh, you, do you want to see the, the reference in the evidence? Is to Mr. No, Allen. I just want to see the reference in the skeleton. Sorry, Par paragraph 49 to. 49 to. Okay, yes, thank you, last line. So what, what we are struggling with is to understand how they apply the test and what communications they say would be captured. In my submission, all of this underlines why the most useful way of analysing and understanding this issue is to test it with examples. So let's take a hypothetical example from this case. Suppose a communication is made from Deckert to its client which reports on Deckett's conversations with Mr. Right, Asadek. And this is, and I'm just not, I'll take this sufficiently slowly so I can write it down. Sorry. Communication with? From Deckett to its client. Yeah. Reporting on Deckett's conversations with Mr. Alcidek about his conditions of detention. their effect on Mr. al and what steps are proposed to be taken as a result. Now, Beckett's... So I appreciate this is only a hypothetical. Yes. What, do you mean, what sort of thing do you mean by what steps are proposed to be taken as a result? Namely, do you mean things like, should there be some change in these conditions? Or... Should be that, or, uh, you know, what, uh, what is proposed to do with the, uh, yes, whether they should change, what its effect is having upon him, how that impacts upon uh, the strategy generally. Uh, okay. Now, Deckard's purpose may simply be to communicate those matters to its client and to provide advice on what to do next. However, we would say that irrespective of what Deckard's purpose is, having regard to what we say is a strong prima facie case of iniquity that Mr. al is being subjected to those unlawful conditions of detention with the aim of extracting information from him. If one accepts for the, for, for the moment that we do make out such a pri strong prima facie case, then such a communication that I have described, we say, is in furtherance of or part of the iniquity. Now, I assume my... My learned friends would say. Sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Uh, I understand you say that, but that's because it reveals the iniquity. It's not because anything to do with 
anybody's purpose in relation to the document coming into existence. If I understand you correctly, it, you, you, your case is part of or in furtherance of the iniquity. It includes documents which reveal the iniquity. Yeah. I mean, that may, that it may not be the client's purpose that they should do so. It could be Robert Peter Comfrey. Yeah. And it may not be Decker's purpose that they should do so. It's not a question of purpose at all. Yeah. Have I understood your case? Um, well... If, if not, I'm not understanding in your example how the document can be said to be uh, for the client's purpose but furthering the iniquity. Well, I'll, I'll come to it, but that's why we say in, in furtherance. It, it may simply be part of what is being sought to be uh, uh, achieved or revealing something about it. And yes, we would say that was uh, uh, covered. Now, my learned friends would say, I think, even if we made out a strong prima facie case uh, on that category of iniquity, they would say that communication would I'm not... Sorry, be I've just been thinking about yeah. that. And if you really are going to come back to it, I don't want to make you anticipate. One way one could say that in that example, the document came within the in furtherance of test would be to adopt more the language of Lord Sumner and talk about the document having been created in the course of things which were being done to further, further the iniquitous purpose. The things that were being done pursuant to the iniquitous purpose on your case, as I've understood it, is effectively putting pressure, unlawful pressure, yeah. on Mr. Al Sadek to cooperate. Yeah. Uh, Deckert's purpose in reporting um, a conversation of the kind that you put into your example wouldn't have anything to do with that purpose, nor uh, would, would the clients. Your case that it falls within iniquity exemption is, is, is of a quite different character, that it's to do with um, that the document is generated in the course of uh, the furtherance of an iniquitous purpose. Have I understood you correctly? You have, you have, my lord. And that's why, although there's a lot of reference to in furtherance of, and I'll take you to the cases, they also talk about communications being part of iniquity. And actually there is some difference, as my learned friend on this, because they say part of is something narrower. Yes. Uh, well, I don't want to take you out of your course, but speaking for myself, and I think actually also for my lords from the discussions we've had, we do find it helpful to focus on some examples of the types of communication, which by definition you don't know are there, but the sort of things that you reasonably suppose may be there, and to test out how the uh, parties' different positions would apply in a hypothetical but not implausible example of that kind. Yeah. So um, if you give us examples like this, you can test we're, we're, uh, they're helpful, but we'll need to know exactly how you put it in relation to each one. I I'm going to give you some more. Um, okay. uh, I, I suppose the client's purpose in your hypothetical example could be to be in a position to form a judgment about whether the objective of getting the information that they want to get from Mr. Al Sadek would be furthered by either making his conditions worse or giving him the carrot of better conditions, visits from his wife or um, more frequent access to showers, um, uh, and uh, using the information which they could supply about how he's getting on and how he's reacting in order to form that judgment. Indeed, my lord, and actually that connects the point I'll come to, which is one of the problems is if you try and analyse this by simply looking at something on the face of the document, you need to understand the, the context of what is being uh, alleged. Well, um, just, just so you're aware of this, my lord's suggested example is of how it might be said to come within the test yeah. is different from mine. Yeah. Not say mine, his is foreign mind is right, on the contrary, but I'm just saying we do need to analyze in the case of any such example just why you say it's covered so this is a useful 
dry that, run for the kind of exercise at some point in the next um, day we're going to want to do with some other examples. I see that, my lord, but I might also add that one could regard a communication either as as part of or it's been created in, in the course of, and also uh, uh, my lord, lord Justice Mel's observation that it could in a one sense also be regarded as being in furtherance. I don't see that they're necessarily mutually exclusive. No, uh, no, I just said they were different, not that yeah. they were inconsistent, but I think we, um, it just requires some stating the obvious, but it requires some careful thinking by reference to specific examples of possibly more than one way. Yeah. But um, anyway, let, you're going to do it later, you tell us, and that'll be very helpful. Um, so, so the only point I just wanted to make to finish on that example is that uh, I assume my learned friends would say, even if you make out the strong prima facie case, that's not caught by the iniquity exception. Um, Yet they accept that an author doesn't need to have an iniquitous purpose when making that communication. Now, they have never explained why the examples that we give in our skeleton, and I, I will come back, as I've already indicated to those, but we've set out for each category of iniquity some categories of documents uh, that, that we say are likely to exist. And my learned friends haven't explained why those are not communications of a type that would fall within the exception, and, and I will come back to well, can I deal with one uh, more point on the on the test? Because uh, I anticipate it's a, a point that may be taken against me. Uh, it's certainly a point that was recorded in in the judgment. I think persuaded uh, the judge at paragraph ninety three that um, that is that our approach cannot be right because it would prevent a client ever getting advice on a past iniquity. They say uh, our proposal is too broad. Now, we of course do not take such an extreme position, and we accept a line has to be drawn that permits bona fide requests for legal advice to be made confidentially by parties who've engaged in iniquitous conduct. Uh, my lords, it's helpful to recognize that there are two kinds of cases where the fraudulent, uh, uh, where the uh, iniquity exception might arise. The first type of case is the iniquity which arises in the course of a transaction in respect of which the solicitor is assisting or is involved in some way. And the solicitor could have a passive uh, rather than an active part and is not aware that he is or she is facilitating the iniquity. And Cox and Railton, that I'll come to in a moment, is one such case. So that's what we uh, would call the category one type of case. There's then the category two type of case, and that's the iniquity that arises in the conduct of proceedings, as in Q8 Airways, or that might arise in the context of advice that is being given about past conduct. My lords, this isn't just the, my categorization, it's a categorization made in O'Rourke uh, by Lord uh, Parmore. So could I just get iniquity in the conduct of proceedings, yeah. or in connection with a past... Advice given about past conduct. So it's not about a current transaction. Why are you bundling those together? They seem to be rather different. Well, the, the reason for bundling together is we don't really need to concern ourselves with category two because right. we're in a category one type of case. Um, and, and the reason for making that distinction that I'll come to is that um, all other things being equal, in my submission, there are likely to be more communications that are caught in a category one type of case than in a category two type of case. Can I just deal, albeit, it, uh, but just so that you have the picture, I just want to say a few words about the category two type of case. If someone seeks bona fide legal advice about their past iniquitous conduct, that is very unlikely to engage the exception. And nor will the exception usually be engaged where that person engages a lawyer to defend it in any proceedings co concerned with that conduct. And we come back to the Abliazov criterion. In neither case of those examples is the solicitor acting outside the scope of the professional relationship. That's not to say, of course, that there might be exceptional category two type cases where the iniquity exception is engaged. So. Uh, a solicitor can be engaged to conduct false evidence as part of the case, uh, 
DQ8 Airways. Uh, and we say there, there is an obvious abuse of a solicitor-client relationship. One could also conceive of cases on my second limb of the Category 2 type case, where a party seeking legal advice about past conduct, uh, there might be situations where the exception is nevertheless engaged. For example, if advice is sought actively to conceal in an unlawful way past wrongdoing. Now, as I just indicated, we're not in a Category 2 type of case. There's no suggestion in this case that the communications with which we are concerned are ones in which the defendants were advising the privilege holders about potential liability in relation to the iniquities. I, I'm having a little bit of difficulty myself in seeing how your Category 2A yeah. differs from Category 1 as a matter of principle. Category 1 is the solicitors assisting in iniquity in the course of a transaction, yeah. and it's the transaction which is iniquitous. Category 2A is the solicitor is assisting in the conduct of proceedings, and it's the conduct of proceedings which is iniquitous. Why, why, why does one draw a distinction between transactions on the one hand and conduct of proceedings on the other if the iniquity is in each case said to be that transaction stroke conduct? Well, I, I have in mind that, that the kind of case where iniquity is going to arise in the in the conduct of proceedings is likely to be much rarer uh, because uh, either it's m m going to be less likely that the solicitor is unaware in, in, in what is happening as it's more likely to ar arise in a non-litigious situa situation in my submission. I can see the point that my Lord is, is making. and it ma This categorisation doesn't matter significantly from, from my argument. It's simply that I wanted to address the point that uh, we are not seeking to draw the line in any way which makes it uh, impossible for clients legitimately to seek bona fide legal advice. So, um, can I turn to that sort of case where it, a transaction in a non-litigious uh, context uh, where defendants are instructed to assist uh, somehow with that transaction and we say that is equivalent to our case and again we say that the touchstone remains uh, in, in uh, the, the Abelazov criterion uh, and as I said earlier we would uh, submit that all things being other things being equal there's likely to be a greater number of lawyer-client communications in a Category 1 type of case if the evidential is, burden is met. Let me just deal with, with one more point of it on this issue. There may be a question as to whether the exception applies where advice is being sought about legality of intended conduct. And it seems uh, to, to us that in some cases those kinds of communications could engage the exception because the purpose of the client in consulting the lawyer is to try to facilitate something unlawful, so Cox and Railton being an example. But there might be cases about possible intended conduct where the client is seeking advice on a bona fide basis, and where, and this is what is important, where the client intends to follow the advice that the lawyer gives. Uh, and in my submission, there would be no relevant iniquitous purpose there, because the client doesn't intend to carry out the proposed conduct if his legal advisor informs him that it is unlawful. And again, one can see there's no obvious abuse of the relationship there. It's a proper use of the solicitor-client relationship. Now, I only make these observations uh, to explain that our interpretation of the in furtherance test is principled. It's in accordance with the authorities. Uh, and to explain that one can draw the line in a proper way and meet the submission that our test is far too broad. But in one sense, on the facts of this case, it's unlikely uh, uh, to matter because, as I say, there's no suggestion that Deckard are claiming privilege over communications where they're advising their clients in respect of uh, uh, unlawfulness, uh, alleged unlawfulness of their conduct. Indeed, their entire pleaded case is that if Mr. al Sadek was mistreated, then they didn't know about it. 
So, my lords, can I make uh, uh, one other broad point, one I alluded to earlier? Uh, and it's this. One of the ways in which we think um, the defendants have gone wrong is by approaching the whole exercise on a document-by-document -document basis, analysing what each communication sizzles in on its face to determine whether it meets the test, but without standing back to consider, in the light of the evidence, two things. First of all, what was the ultimate purpose of the alleged three iniquities? We say it's obvious it was to extract information from Mr. Al Sadek. Those abuses which we say were committed weren't just committed for the sake of it, they were intended to get Mr. Al Sadek to cooperate. So that's one important issue of purpose that needs to be considered. And the other is what was the purpose of Deckert's clients? What was their overall purpose in consulting Deckert? And it, <coughs> rather, point I, I was seeking to make uh, in response to what my Lord Lord Justice Mal said, that that's part of why it's important to stand back and consider the context, and it may be possible to, uh, with that context, see the, indeed important, to see the communication in a different light, rather than just focusing on what the communication says on its face. In fact, when one comes to some of the cases, if one looked at individual communications, without standing back and considering the purpose for which the solicitor is being consulted, one could similarly fall into error. So we say it isn't simply a question of considering what's on the face of the individual document. Uh, my learned friends say in their skeleton, paragraph 50, sub 2, sub B, page 88, they say it would all depend on what the documents actually say. And then you have concluded by reference to what they actually say that the iniquity exception is not engaged. But that is not sufficient, my lords. Focusing on the words alone without considering the context can lead to errors. Could I just go back to something you said yes. in introducing this point? You said they should have stood back to consider what was the ultimate purpose of the alleged three iniquities. Yes. Yes. Got that. Got that straightforward. And what was the overall purpose of the client engaging Deckards? What what extra element? What what? Just pin down why that is also important to the application of the test. Um, well, I mean, it's a, it's connected to, to the former. The purpose of uh, involving uh, Deckard was to, as part of their entire strategy on the, on the investigation. Um, and that is understanding the retainer that Deckert had and why they were being consulted and, and engaged at all is relevant, uh, understanding the context of that uh, instruction is important in analysing whether individual communications uh, were furthering uh, the purpose or not. It may help, my lord, if I come to some. I'm about to come to some examples. Okay. Um, can I just? I'm going not to saying, are you, that because the client's purpose was the iniquitous one you identified, yeah. and because Deckerts were instructed to insist to to assist in that exercise, it follows that everything Deckert did was in furtherance of that iniquitous client's purpose? Or well, are you, or are you? I'm... It depends. I'm, I'm not sure I would say at this stage that everything uh, that they did, um, but insofar as anything was directed to the issue of extracting information from Mr. Al Sadek, then prima facie, yes. As I said, I'm going to deal with some more of the examples in the context of the evidence, but I know it, it, it's obviously less helpful talking in abstract terms, so let me give you, at this juncture, three, ex three examples. First is, I'm going to take this one because there is some acceptance of what the evidence shows. So the first one is communication surrounding uh, Dr. Mitchell's 
inspection. You may have seen reference in the skeletons and uh, the evidence to an inspection that uh, Dr. Mitchell uh, made uh, uh, visiting uh, Mr. Al Sadek uh, in Al Bari Rat. And do the defendants accept that there was a sufficient, there is a sufficient prima facie case that around the 29th of October 2015, the conditions in which Mr. Al Sadek Al Sadek was being kept uh, were in breach of his uh, uh, human rights, and on the basis, uh, and that was on the basis of Mr. Mitchell's evidence, and that's recorded. You'll see it in my learned friend's skeleton argument at paragraph 33, page 82. The respondents accept there's a very strong prima facie case that at or on around 29th of October 2015. The conditions in which the appellant was detained at Al Barirat reached Article 3 of the ECHR. Now, the uh, defendants have said there are no communications in furtherance of that iniquity. Mr. Al Sadek's uh, legal team sought disclosure of communications surrounding Dr. Mitchell's inspection. Uh, you'll see, in fact, let, if Sorry, you... is, it, is it breached Article 3 of the ECHR or? would have breached Article 3 if the Convention had applied. Um, this is not in Europe. Must be the latter. Uh, it? it was in the context of, Ita of Italian extradition proceedings, because it was about, in the context, you may have seen a reference was to it. it. Precisely, so it would have been a sur surrey type approach. You know. I see. Um, would my lord mind just taking up uh, the supplementary bundle uh, you're in hard copy that's in the first volume tab 8 page 196 in fact if you wouldn't mind just looking at the bottom of 195 first uh, okay. sorry for a moment have on page 195 the bottom the defendants were required to provide a written explanation of the nature of any communications uh, to which Dr. Mitchell was party which had been disclosed which, which has been entirely withheld from inspection on grounds of legal professional privilege and then he sets out the explanation given by Mr. Allen the withheld documents comprise communications concerning logistics of Dr. Mitchell's inspection including advanced information communications regarding the completion of Dr. Mitchell's inspection, details about his invoice, and further dialogue about his inspection. Now, my lords, in circumstances where Dr. Mitchell was asked to produce a, a favourable report, but was unwilling to do so, and if you want the reference for the background of the instruction, uh, it's in Mr. Allen's ninth witness statement, paragraph 73, supplementary bundle, tab 7, Hang on one second. Can you have the reference again? Uh, Alan 9, paragraph 73. Supplementary bundle, tab 7, page 139. And also Mr. Chatterloo's sixth witness statement, paragraph 83. Supplementary bundle, tab 2, page 54. Uh, it, it's, it's not disputed what that Mr. Mitchell's inspection was to support uh, an attempt to extradite uh, Mr. Izzad, Izzad Panar. Now, we say the circumstances in which Dr. Mitchell was asked to produce a favourable report in support of that application, but wasn't willing to do so. Uh, we say, how can it be the case in those circumstances that, in of that instruction that communications which followed his inspection, including the further dialogue, are not part of or in furtherance of the iniquity. Obviously, I, I don't think I need to um, emphasize the point, but the, Mr. Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell, of course, entirely innocent, but that doesn't mean that communications with him about 
what he found about the conditions that are not caught by the exception. Well, you say it's, you, you asked that rhetorically, but pin down. Yeah. Who's whose purpose? Yes. And, and what is the per individual's purpose of a letter to um, Mr. Mitchell saying thank you very much for your visit? Well, again, I come back to the context here. Mr. Al Sadek's case is that Mr. Dr. Mitchell was effectively asked to produce a favourable report. Uh, notwithstanding that the, the conditions at Al Bararat were not satisfactory, those conditions uh, uh, were, were attempted to be approved. Mr. Dr. Mitchell inspected, and yet the, he still reached the view that he did. Now we say in that in those circumstances, he's like an innocent solicitor or an innocent tool. The whole context for his instruction was to try and seek some good image of Al Bararat so that somebody else could be detained there. So we say that entire instruction of Dr. Mitchell uh, is in furtherance of that iniquity because the whole purpose was to try and show that the conditions there were favourable. So the reason is that whole purpose of instruction of Mitchell was to show that conditions which were in fact breach of human rights standards were not. Um, how do we pin this into uh, Dr. al Sadek into the purpose? Well, it's, it's, it's part of... Uh... This was not... You'll have to remind me. Um, Dr. Mitchell was asked to go and see Dr. Al Sadek in detention. Is that yes, right? Yes. For the purpose of extradition proceedings, which would have involved his extradition to Italy. No, not his extradition. Well, that, that's why I, I thought not either. But that's what Is puzzled that? me. Why do you send someone to see X in order to find out about the about Y? Um, I. That is a detail I may need to come back to. I, I I, I, I'm not being pernickety. I just want to, I just want to, to get a clear analytical framework in my mind as to how this example fits into the submission that you're making. I'm not saying it doesn't. I just want it clearly so the, spelt out. The, the application was to try and extradite Mr. Izzat Hanar from Italy to Iraq, and I think as part of that, uh, the purpose of the instruction was to show everything's fine in in um, Al Barirat, and that. So it's just chance he happens to see see Dr. Al Sadek, is it? Well, I mean there must be hundreds of people in Al or maybe not hundreds. I don't know how big it is, but I mean, why does he go and see Dr. Al Sadek? Yeah. Well, I I may have to come back to you on the on the precise details of that, but the connection uh, there is a connection with Mr. Uh, Al Sadek in the sense that all of these uh, Mr. Isada. Is part of the same uh, investigation. You see his name appearing in the uh, in the various uh, project reports, forming part of further evidence. And we know you'll have seen reference to um, Mr. Buchanan, uh, the, the, the possible reference to him saying that he might like uh, uh, a note being removed from the file. It's 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 artificial, I think, to separate this out and say, well, this how does this go to uh, the case against uh, Mr. Al Sadek. Uh, these abuses are, are connected, it may have been for the purpose of the extradition uh, proceedings involving Mr. Izzad al Kanar, but um, they obviously concerned uh, the conditions that Mr. Al Sadek was uh, under. But does, does your submission on this depend upon the instruction of Dr. Mitchell? Having been intended to procure a false report, essentially. I mean, what, what happens if they simply uh, ask him to come along and report? And the report, uh, and then, then, then there is a document which is, let us say, from Decker's client, giving details of what Dr. Mitchell has told them, 
all about the conditions in which Mr. Hasebeck is being held. Now, is that within the exception? Well, I think my Lord is right. There has to be ultimately an iniquitous purpose. And yes, so we would say that uh, it was part of a, a strategy mm. to uh, try and um, find a way of um, creating a report on these conditions that would make them look favourable. Well, I wonder. Isn't, aren't you making difficulties for yourself? I, it is part of the strategy, you say, to keep Dr. al Sadek in, in human conditions in order to put pressure on them to cooperate. Yeah. Here is a piece of evidence that shows that he was checked in Uh, the question is whether that evidence can be um, uh, withheld on the basis that it's covered by legal professional privilege. Uh, the privilege being, I forget, we'd have to look at the table, but what, because it was created actually not for the, in the present, but, but for the Italian extradition proceedings. Um, isn't it enough for you to say, um, at any rate on the broadest version of your case, uh, that the document was produced yes I see I th what I, I well, you could say it was simply the, the, the document revealed what was happening to um, uh, Dr. Al Sadag. Well, when that was put to you earlier as a way of putting it, um, I think you slightly shied away from adopting that formulation that um, Lord Justice Pottlewell put to you, and maybe you were right to do so. As you can tell, I'm thinking aloud. I just yes. I want to pin down exactly how the ratio in the case law or how the principle shown in the case law applies to this particular example let me um if i may uh, I'm perhaps we should come back to it and i may have to think more and come back to it let me just see if i can get when, more when you do, i think it's still your case that the formulation in your draft order is justified yeah. which is documents reporting on Um, let me just deal with two examples about hacking. Um, now, one of the things that has emerged from the further evidence is that Mr. Gerard uh, did, we say, use some of the fruits of hacking in his inter interrogation of Mr. Al Sadek. Uh, and you can see Mr. Chatterloo uh, in his 18th witness statement, paragraph 18.3, further evidence bundle, tab 2, page 20. Uh, you don't need to turn the documents up, but if I just explain that in one of the reports, there's a screenshot of an email between Mr. Al Sadek, Mr. Farhad Azima, and a journalist of the Wall Street Journal. I'm so sorry, can you just give me that reference again? Yes, uh, it's Chatterloo 18, paragraph 18.3, further evidence, bundle 1, tab 2, page 20. Uh, and what Mr. Chatterloo explains in that witness statement, and he exhibits the documents too, uh, in one of the hacking reports, there's a screenshot of an email between Mr. Al Sadek, uh, Mr. A a Farhad Azima, and a journalist at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, that's in a, a report in, th uh, in August 2015, the 3rd of August. Uh, and we then see in a second attendance note of an interview by Mr. Gerard of Mr. Al Sadek 10 days later, where he puts to Mr. Al Sadek that he's seen evidence that Mr. Al Sadek provided evidence to that journalist. And we say it's an escapable inference, he must have derived that information from the Beach report. Now, to the extent that there are communications with Mr. Gerard or others at DECA, 
who discussed the implications of the hacked material, all the cases that they were building against Mr. al Sadat, or to the extent that there are materials uh, in which the evidence that Mr. al Sadat gave was deployed against him, we say those communications and materials can and should be regarded as being in furtherance of or part of uh, that inequity. Yeah, that's my Qualification is to the extent that the communications discussed that material. Yes. And there's a second qualification. Yes. Wasn't it? Materials in which the evidence that Mr. Arsadek gave were deployed against him. Sorry, materials. Materials from the hacking. Yes, materials exactly from the hacking were, were deployed, deployed against. against him. Then those sorts of communications materials materials would be caught, we say, by the iniquity exception. But the, but the hacking, uh, in particular the hacking of other people, is not one of the three iniquities which you said you rely on. Yes. I, mean, I suppose you might have made a case that um, this whole investigation was tainted by widespread hacking so that privilege didn't attach to the investigation at all, but that's not the case but that you seem to be making. My Lord is right, and that's obviously... Put. There, are, there are some allegations about hacking, but about a later period of hacking of, of Mr. Arsadek's solicitors. My Lord is right, because this evidence emerged later, and it's a point taken against me that, well, the allegations about hacking, which, by the way, my Lord, are in a draw, that there are pleadings that have been amended at the moment, haven't yet crystallised where these allegations arising out of this further evidence are going to be pleaded. And uh, I think we, we, we discussed, you, yes, well, perhaps you just answered the point, we, we discussed this at the press at, at and you made it clear that you were not at this stage, whatever you might do if you got permission to amend, yes. um, uh, relying on the hacking as a self-standing iniquity. That's right, isn't it? That is right, my Lord. Can I, though, make just <coughs> three points on First of all, and we've tried to set this out in our supplementary skeleton about why the hacking materials are nevertheless relevant to the existing three categories of iniquity, and we rely on all those points. Um, second point, the note. Sorry, just give me the reference where that is in the skeleton. Um, it's the further evidence skeleton. Yes, further yeah. evidence skeleton. Tab, um, uh, second. Volume tab ten, page six hundred and twenty-one. Um, well, most of the skeleton really deals with why all this hacking material is is relevant to the existing. And I, I'm sorry, the way you introduced it, I thought that was a, as it were, a paragraph that summarised it. But no, okay, that's fine. Um, so there's that point. The, new, the note that I'm about to come to will show you, will make good that point, that actually the hacking and the human rights issues that we're concerned with are bound up with each other. The other point I want to make that I made before my Lord uh, at the hearing in, in November was that, in one view, it doesn't matter if they're pleaded or not, because if there's iniquity, then my learned friend's legal team need to consider that. And Mr. Allen accepts that uh, in one of his witness statements. Can I just take you quickly to a reference in supplementary bundle... One tab five, page one hundred and ten. Page one hundred. So this is um, Mr. Allen's an extract you've got here of Mr. Allen's fourth witness statement. And if you could read what Enyo said in their letter uh, of the twenty fifth of June, which is sorry, uh, t t supplementary bundle. Supplementary bundle tab, tab five. Tab five, page one hundred and ten. Wait, 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 wait. Which paragraph? 51. 51, thank you. You just want to read that. Yes. <clears throat> well, that's obvious. That's, that's right. But the point is you're asking for an order from the court. Um, directed to certain particular issues, and you've chosen the battleground on which to fight, and this isn't at this I, stage. I have, my lord, but I'm trying to give you examples of why yep. we say their whole approach is too narrow, 
and in a sense that doesn't, if I can show you in the context of a hacking communication, they've taken a too narrow approach, then it suggests they've done that elsewhere as well. Um, well it's quite, quite notable that the list of um, iniquities, one to eight, in the following paragraph doesn't include hacking. Although hacking allegations involving Deckert have been around for some time. Yes. Um, I'm trying to find the. Well, the, the sorry, sub 8 does incorporate the hacking that's gone on since 2020. Um, let me just deal then with it. this. This is to pick up the newest document that's been disclosed uh, as part of Mr. Allen's 17th uh, witness statement. So, are we, we've now moved on from, from you said you were giving three examples. Yes, the first was Dr. Third. Mitchell, the second was the hacking one. This is the third, is it? This is the third. Yes, yes right, thank you. Um, so, sorry, I, Michael, I, I didn't really understand what your point was on paragraph 52. Simply yeah. that the, the last point, the, the review team had to be alert to all forms of iniquity, whether pleaded or otherwise. So, my point is if, if in the course of their review, solicitors come across documents which they consider that there's something iniquitous that has gone on and there are communications made as part of or in furtherance of that iniquity then they cannot be withheld on the basis of they cannot be withheld on the basis of privilege if there's something iniquitous that has gone on. But yes, but I don't quite understand why you're making that point. Because, because it's said said against me that well we don't you can't make any criticisms about what or has not been disclosed about the hacking because um, not, that hasn't been the pleadings haven't fully crystallised on that issue yet. I think it's taken as a as a relevance. Well, can I just then deal with this document that's been uh, recently disclosed? So this is the document that Mr. Uh, Allen says, while well, we've been through the, our, our disclosure again and we've come up with one redaction we think shouldn't have been redacted. Um, I can just take you directly to that. Um, it's in the Further Evidence Bundle 2. The actual the page you need is 685 behind tab 16. You've got the there's a manuscript version of this, but this is the, the, the transcription. Um, this we say this is a, a note uh, of a discussion that took place um, between Mr. Hughes, David Hughes of, of Deckett, and the ruler. And we say that this evidence is that there was a discussion that took place about the fruits of hacking because of this. You have a date. Sorry? We have a date for the discussion. Yes, it was, I think, uh, we were told that it's, the we were originally told, I think, the 27th, but it's the 26th of April, 2016. Uh, and the, the part that's now been unredacted uh, on the basis of the further evidence and the application of the iniquity exception is in the red. Stuart Page has a copy of Skype call. Now, um, as I say, this evidence is a discussion that... So that, sorry, that's the bit that's been unredacted. Correct. Now, the only materials, we know the discussion took place between Mr. Hughes and the ruler, <coughs> and there's a reference there to uh, Skype calls. And um, we say it is surprising, to say the least, that the only material that the defendants say is caught by the uh, iniquity exception is this sentence, which refers to the existence of hacked materials, but nothing about 
what was discussed about them. It's, it's, it's peculiar, it's about the fact only of them. But that any discussion about those materials, one would expect that they, they would then follow. We would say those would be communications, as, which would be part of or in furtherance of the iniquity. Going too fast, but just write down what it is you say it, this shows is missing. So, Stuart Page has a copy of the Skype calls, it refers to the fact of the hacked materials. Yes, there is nothing then, everything else we assume that is then followed by something. If not in this communication, then in another one. It's just the something I want to write down. It's what, what do you say must be there that hasn't been disclosed? The, the contents of the fruits of the hacking of the calls. Can I complete the, the picture for my, uh, for my laws? So there ought to have been disclosed in these proceedings, you're saying, everything that was obtained as a result of the hacking. Is that what you mean by the fruits of the call? Yes. I'm just trying to yes. get this down as yes. your third example yes. of what, what should yes. have been disclosed in, yes. these, in, the, in these proceedings. Yes. Now, um, Sorry, is that, that's a yes to what my law put to yeah. you, if, the, if it, it satisfies the test for, is relevant, then yes. That's quite a big if, isn't it? Well, well we've explained how the, the hacking, you say, is caught, is caught up with it. So yes, we say that it's all part of the investigation, part of the... Uh, but then what would matter would be the fact, that, suppose that, that there was hacking, but the hacking produced nothing of any significance, all trivial stuff that's not nothing to do with the case at all. Um, you may say not very likely, but I mean, uh, one just doesn't know. Well, it was just to, to complete on, on this, the uh, my my instructing solicitors wrote wrote to Enyo about this uh, disclosure and they, having gone through earlier disclosure, found a note from, um, I think, the same, is it the same day? Yes, the same day, um, that you will see, you see the letter from Stoko in the following tab at page, at tab 18, page 702, and the note is uh, uh, after that letter. Um, it's, again, a report that's emerged from the hacking on page <coughs> 705. And, and you can see the explanation, what uh, Stoko say at page 703. They found this Word document, the matter of data of which indicates it was authored, authored by Carolyn Timberlake, Mr. Page's secretary. And it's a, a, the file name of the document is New Update Regarding Dima Salome. That's Mr. Arsidek's wife. <coughs> and then you've got the text uh, of the document, which is, is set out in that. Um, the same as 705, so we yes. might just as well read yes. it here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just let me read it. that there Stoko say that um, it's to be inferred given the closeness of these things and the, the Skype calls on exactly the same day that the, the inference is that the reference <coughs> in the unredacted bit of Mr Hughes's note is to these Skype calls between uh, Dima Salome and Mr uh, Azima and um, we then asked Enyo to confirm whether they accepted that Mr Hughes received the fruits of hacking in the form of those messages, or at least that he was made aware of them, and then discussed them with the ruler. And then you'll see Enyo's response uh, at the following tab, page 706, 
I'll just ask you to read what they say there at paragraph four. I'm afraid I don't have that. Or is it in the next Ah, uh, it was should have been part of an update that <coughs> there were quite a lot of updates, and I did my best. Yes, I'm so sorry. That. I have. We say uh, this is a rather unsatisfactory response, and indeed, I, to my submission, rather carefully worded in saying that Mr. Hughes denies he received the Skype messages referred to in the note and denies being aware of any hacking activity. But it's hard to understand how he can say he was not aware of the messages because his note refers to them. Um, and it fails to give any explanation for what Mr. Hughes understood to be the copy of the Skype calls, what he understood Mr. Page to be doing and why he was discussing them with the ruler at all. But even if Mr. Hughes was himself unaware that he was discussing unlawful activity with the ruler, that isn't relevant for these purposes. If unlawful hacking has taken place and he was discussing with the ruler the product of that activity, then we say those discussions would be caught by the fraud exception. Six eight five. The note we're talking about. Yes. You told us it's a transcription of some manuscript. Yes. You'd like to see it. Well, I don't necessarily like to see it, but it's, it's the fact that sums in black and you told me sums in red. But they're two different hands. I, no. Um, let me. The red bit just just means the unredacted bit. Correct. So. My six seven five is the is the handwritten. But what? But your evidence is. That the handwriting is that of Mr. Hughes. Yes. These are I Mr. Hughes's any, notes. Yes. I don't think there's any dispute with this, Mr. No, no, fine. I just wanted to know. <coughs> well, was, that, that's the test. I'm going to just come to the, the, the authorities in, in a moment. Can I just deal with another point about what it is that Mr. Al Sadek needs to prove on, on this part uh, of his appeal? Now, my learned friends say that a point that we have missed, and they say this in paragraph 12 of their skeleton, page 77, is that you need to find that there was strong prim prima facie evidence of two things. First of all, the existence of the alleged iniquity, and secondly, prima strong prima facie evidence that communications in question were made in furtherance of or as part of that uh, alleged iniquity. Sorry, uh, you're, you're, two things. What, what, what are they? Um, existence of the alleged iniquity. Yeah. And that communications were made in furtherance yeah. of that iniquity. Thank you. And we, we accept that both those elements need to be established. Mr. Chatterloo accepted that in his uh, sixth statement, paragraph 50. However, we disagree with how that assessment should take place. And in particular, we strongly disagree with the respondents and the approach of the judge that he could properly determine limb two of that test before considering limb one. Uh, my learned friends say at paragraph 24 of their skeleton, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, aside from Butler and Board of Trade, which is a very particular kind of case that I'm going to come to, we on this side of the court are not aware of a single case other than the decision of this judge where the court has sought to determine the second limb before considering whether the alleged iniquity has been made out. And we say there's very good reason for that. It would generally be illogical to decide whether there are likely to be privileged communications in furtherance of or as part of an iniquity prior to determining whether the iniquity is made out. And I hope the point is obvious, because the assessment of the second issue is going to be affected by the determination 
of the first and what the nature and scope of the, the conduct that is found to have been met through that pri strong prima facie case. You might have a dispute about what the scope of that conduct is. So we say it's obvious that the two questions will overlap and on any view the second question will be informed by the first. And in fact you see from a number of the cases that where the first limb is satisfied the court finds that there's a prima facie or strong prima facie case of the relevant iniquity that may effectively be dispositive and the satisfaction of the second limb just follows from the first. Indeed Barrowfin that my learned friends reply, uh, ref rely on is such a case. The court there goes through the evidence. We haven't been tainted in these cases now. You're making submissions about lots of cases which well, we haven't seen yet. Yes, I'm trying to make my propositions and then trying to do it in the most economical way okay. possible. Okay, sorry, you do it your way. Um, I don't, I'm just thinking for your notes, if you want to look at it later, I've got better examples of this, but Barofen, page paragraph 97, page 1090, you will see that having found that the strong prima facie case of the iniquities was made out, the court just concludes that the, the defendants should give disclosure. Just one more point about this two-limb stage, uh, and it may not be necessary, but I want to make clear it's important not to elevate the second limb into some sort of requirement on the applicant to identify each document to which the exception applies and respect of which the evidential uh, hurdle is met. Um, and I, I say that, it may be obvious, but I, given what my learned friends say about our failure to engage with this uh, second issue, it's an important point to make. Plainly, an applicant is very rarely going to be able to identify a specific document that it claims is caught by the exception. Typically, it's only going to know the privilege has been claimed over a category of documents. Uh, and that must be right, because if an applicant were so required, then challenges would rarely get off the ground. So I don't need to establish for your uh, lordships a strong prima facie case that documents A, B, and C are ones where the evidential burden is met. I just need to satisfy you to the relevant standard that there exists privileged material that was part of or in furtherance of the iniquity. Uh, on the standard, we're all agreed that in this case I need to make, meet the strong prima facie case. Why, a, why, why do you accept that? Well, my lord, I think we, we because that, albeit we say that you don't need to satisfy yourselves that uh, Deckert, you don't need to find that Deckert were involved in this iniquity. Uh, that is often used as a basis for saying this isn't one of the issues in the case, therefore we're only on a prima facie case. But I think I must accept that some of the points are I am making are to some extent bound up with uh, some of the allegations um, that are being made in the case. So I'm not with quite the understanding the point you're making. Are you simply saying that because that's what Lord Justice Longmore said in Kuwait Airways number six? Yes. And how does what he said square with what the House of Lords said in O'Rourke and Derbyshire, where I think all four of the law lords used the expression prima facie? That was, wasn't it, a case in which the, the iniquity was in relation to an issue that had to be decided in the case? Yes, well, I mean, I, I consider that I'm bound by what is said in, in Kuwait Airways, and I ha ha it isn't specifically an issue that we've sought to to appeal on. on this. No, well, you didn't below. Sorry? You, you argued below. You did argue below. But you not, you not sought to appeal. What, what does... What, what, what does prima facie case mean? And what does strong prima facie case, well, case mean in practice to you, sir? Well, indeed, my lord, I think that's one of the reasons we decided not to spend time on it, because as, uh, as Mr Justice Wynott said in Derby and Co and well done, it's all the spectrum anyway, and the court will know when it's satisfied on the basis of what is before it or not. So I'm not well, sure... Speaking for myself, I'm not sure that I do know what... what what standard of probability is encompassed by prima facie and what is strong, strong prima facie and what is very, very strong, strong prima facie. Right. At the moment, in my relatively untutored state, what I've taken away from O'Rourke and Derbyshire is that prima facie, which is the test they applied, is something more than sufficient to survive a strikeout. So, put in modern terms, more than 
serious issue to be tried or at the summary judgment test. Um, but uh, maybe akin to the kind of probabilities that one sees explored in the jurisdiction cases, a good arguable case for a jurisdiction gateway, the better of the arguments. And then Brownlee, that means the evidence just has to be plausible. That maybe, I don't know. Strong prima facie, very strong prima facie. Does that mean, on your case, more probable than not? Or, or what does it mean? I, 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 I mean, I have to say, just speaking entirely for myself, yeah. I, don't, I don't regard that as obvious. And we're supposed to be giving a judgment which gives guidance as to how people apply the test. Yes. Well, the impression one has it in the case law is judge will know when they feel that they've been sufficiently satisfied. <laughs> the, uh, the point I'd come back to is we say, and I'll be giving you submissions on the evidence, that it doesn't matter because we make out a strong prima facie case. But what do you mean by that? Do you mean that you, That's you that, that a strong prima facie case means it's more probable than not and we can be satisfied, but it's more probable than not? Or do you say that it's you don't have to go above a 50-50? Or do you say um, it, it's good enough in my case that it's a... You know, very, very likely, because we say it's very, very likely in this case. What's, what's the test? Can I address you on the cases and ponder that, my lord, overnight and see if I can assist? Yeah. Yeah. I think that would make sense, because what, you may be right, but this too remains to be seen, that whatever the test you pass it, um, but we will want to give as much guidance as we can for this case, but also for others. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a point, I think, on which we work from more assistance. I, I will endeavour to do so. So, um, authorities bundle, bundle one, Cox and Railton, which I'm sure I always have looked at before, the case which is cited as the basis for the rule. Um, behind tab two. This was a just while you're finding it, just to sure you recall uh, the facts, it's concerned with the prior transaction and the role of the solicitor in that prior transaction. So we say the type of situation with which we are concerned here. The solicitor uh, in question was engaged to advise about whether two partners lawfully transfer an interest in some goods under a bill of sale. The solicitor advised that that would not be possible and the prosecution then called the solicitor for evidence at the criminal trial, and the evidence was to the effect that, 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 the, that the solicitor had given was that they couldn't lawfully dispose of their interest in the way that they were suggesting. Cox and Railton were then convicted, including in part based on that evidence, and they appealed against the conviction on the grounds that the evidence of their solicitor ought not to have been admitted because it was privileged. Um, could you just look briefly first at page... Uh, I sh I'll refer to the numbers, not the internal page numbers, but in the red, page 36. Um, and just to draw your attention, sorry, it's rather difficult without any uh, lettering, but uh, about two-thirds of the way down, you'll see we must take it. Yeah. There's a reference to Mr. Goodman's, uh, the communication with Mr. Goodman uh, being a preparatory step. And there's commentary there about the fact that he was uh, innocent. So this solicitor there, Mr. Goodman, was giving his opinion in good faith. If you then move over, move to 167, and you, you have these passages under la, uh, uh, sidelined, but the ones I'd just like to draw your attention to uh, <coughs> here are, this is all in the uh, judgment of Mr. Justice Stephen, you can just look at what it says halfway down, the reason on which the rule is said to rest, um, setting out the, the test, and then he gives an example of a solicitor instructed to draw a will. Again, example of a solicitor <coughs> acting bona fide. Um, if you turn the page again, there's a discussion of a uh, by Mr. Justice Stephen of the case of Follett and Jeffries. Um, 
again, if you look halfway down, indented, it is true that this is only a dictum. You could then just read uh, <coughs> down to the rest of the page, so about five lines from the bottom. And if, if you turn over to page 169, halfway down there's a discussion of another case, Gartside and Utram. And Mr. Justice Stephen have quotes approvingly <coughs> from that case towards the end of the page, about 10 lines from the bottom. The, the following observations in the judgment appear to us very weighty and bear directly on the present question. Well, do we need to look at the things before that? It appears to approve. Then the next page, bottom of 100, and, uh, sorry, 41. This is now uh, approving of another case, Red uh, Queen and Alton. And you see the underlined the principle. Titchborne claimant case, isn't it? Sorry. It's the Titchborne claimant case. Oh, yes. Um, and then if you turn over the page 100. And to, sorry, page 42, and the passage in particular that I rely on is just towards the bottom of the sidelining, so I think here that if the communication has not for its immediate object, but still affects the accomplishment of it. This is Lord Coburn, this is the Lord Coburn, Chief Justice. Isn't it? Yes, it is, my, it is my Lord, and I think my other friend picked up, who said it was Mr Justice Stephen, but actually he's quoting Chief Justice Coburn. How much was just down to the side, the end of the side? Line? Yes. Just um, must say I've had some difficulty with this passage really I've so far only read it in Stellison's reading it again here what is a communication which encourages the attorney to take greater care and use more diligence well I we would focus on the the, the previous phrase still affects uh, yes I know but that, I'm trying to that that, that is an odd, it's not an odd, it's a rather general phrase in yeah. 19th century language. So to see what he meant by it, he means by inducing the attorney to take. This isn't just a communication to ask them to do this thing, which although the attorney isn't told this is private, it's, it's something more, some more particular communication, obviously, Lord Coburn has in mind. Yeah. I was just trying to understand what that was. Don't worry, we can read it for ourselves. But you, ha you, you haven't got an immediate answer. I don't have a convenient answer, and I think okay. there's more reliance on effects the accomplishment of it. Um, my Lord, and then just uh, follow page 43, halfway down, upon these grounds, we consider the question asked of Mr Goodman in the present case was properly put and answered. So, effectively, Mr Justice Stephen applies the principle to the state to decide the questions were properly put. Do we, do we need also to look at the reference up further up the page to Titchborn and Lushy? Yes. The quality consults an attorney and obtains advice for what afterwards turns out to be the commission of a crime or a fraud. That party still consulting the attorney has no privilege whatever. To close the lips of the attorney 
from stating the truth. That looks as though that's a formulation which, which does capture the concept that what is accepted from the privilege is anything which reveals the truth. Yes. That was all I was going to show you on Cox and Railton. Um, I'm going to come back to O'Rourke in the context of, of the evidential, of the, when, when I just address you on the evidence. But if you could go to Butler and Board of Trade. So, sorry, while, we, while we've got yes. it open. Yes. Which again may be relevant in both legal aspects. It's Cossman 175, 46 of the bundle. Sorry, my lord, which are the authority? 46 of the, 46 of the bundle, 175 of the report. Yes. Cox and Railton. Justice Stephen is especially addressing that each case will have to be judged on its facts. The only thing for which we feel authorised to say is that in each particular case, the court must determine upon the facts actually given yes. in evidence or proposed to be given in evidence whether it seems probable that the accused person may have consulted his legal advisor, so that's the prima facie element of the test, not after the commission of the crime, for the legitimate purpose of being defended, but before the commission of the crime, for the purpose of being guided or helping in the committee. So that, that then is the in furtherance element. Yes. So we've got two, two more formulations there. I need to choose one. Well, can we go to Butler? Because, as I said, this is relied on by my learned friends for this two-stage uh, proposition. So we're not going to do a rock now. I'm coming back to it okay, shortly, maybe fine. tomorrow, but I am coming back to it. Butler, um, as I say, it's, a, it's, it's the case they cite to support their proposition one needs to satisfy two separate limbs. Now, I just need to tell you a little bit about the facts because it's a very different sort of case. As I mentioned, it was concerned with a specific single communication, privileged communication, where there was unchallenged evidence before the court as to the origin and purpose of that document. Just let me just uh, tell you briefly the facts. The plaintiff was facing criminal proceedings brought by the Board of Trade for alleged offences under the Companies Act uh, in 1948 in connection with two dissolved companies. And the plaintiff... <coughs> wanted to prevent the defendant from adducing in evidence at the criminal trial a letter which had been written to him by his solicitor and had come into the hands of the official receiver following the winding up of the companies. Everyone knew what letter they were talking about. Uh, and what had happened was that the solicitor had, un had volunteered, unsolicited, a warning uh, to the client that he needed to take care. And there was then an argument between the parties whether the relevant test was whether the communication simply needed to be relevant to the charge of fraud or <coughs> needed to be in furtherance of it. And Mr Justice Goff said it was the latter. Um, there is an important first point, there's a couple of points I, I'd like to make uh, about this. If you wouldn't mind turning to page 130 uh, of the report and between letter B and D, which is where Mr Justice Goff is addressing this point, that the test is not one of relevance, it's about whether uh, this communication was in, shown to be in furtherance of the fraud. He makes an important uh, observation that in many cases, and indeed most, relevance and in furtherance of will lead to the same result. If, you, if, you, if my lords want to just read between uh, at the top of page 687 down to the end just before letter D.
process? Uh, well, it was, it, in that case, there was a difference between the application of the two tests, relevance and in furtherance of. And um, well, in furtherance of wasn't wasn't the alternative. No, it wasn't the alternative. No, sorry, my lord, I didn't want to miss it. In furtherance or part of or what in preparation for. Yes, sorry, what I mean is he he clarified that the choice, the, didn't we, just below T yes. and at the end of that yes. paragraph. Yes. He clarifies that the test is in in, in furtherance of. Well he does that's my lord's point, he doesn't. He uses a wider phrase, does, being in does. preparation for, or in furtherance, or as part. Yes. And Threefold. I, he does, and I rely... Uh, You're using in furtherance of as a... As a, as a, a catch-all. Uh, as a catch-all, but I, I understand that's a useful shorthand, but you, could, you might lose something by... No, I, I agree with my lords entirely, and in fact, I want to pray that in aid, that he doesn't just talk about in furtherance of, he also talks of in preparation for, or as part of. And indeed, we say that must mean that those those uh, expressions mean something different to in, fur in furtherance of. Um, and this is important as well, uh, because my learned friends say that <coughs> the expression part of must mean something narrower than in furtherance of. It must be a, some sort of subcategory. They say, and you see this in their skeleton at paragraph 37, they say that part of must mean that the communication is iniquitous in itself. But we don't agree, and we don't see why part of should, must, must mean some kind of subcategory. In fact, we say there's a much better argument for saying that part of is, is a wider, not a narrower uh, concept, because that is consonant with Lord Sumner and O'Rourke about brought into existence in the course of the other observations that, that my Lord Lord Justice Bobber Wells yeah, made. We, have, we, haven't, we haven't seen it all yet. So. Yeah. Um, so part of, we say, must be something broad, not narrow, as my learned friends say. Um, Sorry, just give me one moment. I just want to see exactly what you say. Paragraph 37. Yeah. Sorry, no need for a if you, unless I check it myself. Yes, I see. Okay, that is what they say. We don't even understand what, it, what does it mean to say a document is iniquitous in itself. In any event, part of, uh, on the basis of what uh, Mr. Justice Goff says in this decision, we say it shows that they, these are broad, like broad concepts, and, uh, and uh, it must mean something uh, uh, broader. Now, in, in just to finish on the two limb test, so that was a special case in Butler because everyone knew what the communication in question was, and it was my submission not surprising, where a solicitor volunteers unsolicited a warning to their client that the court says, well, that's not in furtherance of. Um, one can't then say that on the basis of that decision, the judge's approach in this case was entirely appropriate, that he could just not bother with the looking at stage one at all and could jump immediately to stage two. Well, can we then go to um, ex parte France? That is behind tab twelve. That is obviously the, the this is obviously the authority to the proposition that not only can the iniquity apply where the solicitor is innocent, but also where the client is innocent. The iniquity may be that of a third party who's not uh, the privileged holder. Perhaps I could just say, as I happen to have noticed it at, at, at page six eight nine back in Butler. Board of Trade, he repeats the test of the prima facie case and then the threefold point in preparation for, or in furtherance, or as part of it. Thank you, um, Ex parte Francis, your, my lords will remember the applicants, the solicitors there, had brought a judicial review of an order under the drug Sorry, Sorry, just, just, just pausing one moment. I was just wondering um, whether, given as my Lord has emphasised, this Justice Goff carefully picked on that threefold formulation and used yes. it at least three times, 
whether we can see where it came from. I was just seeing whether whether there was anything in council's argument that helps on that. But that's maybe this isn't come out from the cases you'll take us to later. But if not, it might be worth those behind you just checking if we can see the origin of that phrase. It may be Mr. Justice Groff made it up for himself, but um, yeah, we'll do that. Okay. Uh, Ex body Francis, at twelve, page two ninety one. Um, the case where African solicitors have brought to judicial review of an order against the Drug Traffic Offences Act, requiring them to produce files relating to the purchase of properties carried out for client. Their client was related to a drug trafficking suspect, and the police sought disclosure of the files as they believed some of the proceeds of the drug drug trafficking had been used to purchase certain properties. So in this case, my lord proceeded on the assumption that the client was unaware the proceeds of crime had been used to assist in the purchase of properties. And the House of Lords held that the relevant provisions of PACE, uh, which they considered reflected the common law, caught the documents because it wasn't necessary for the criminal purpose to be that of the holder of the items. It could be the criminal purpose of a third party. And the relevant passage 248, uh, 249, we, we've just sidelined, I think, the top of 249, but if you start from Lord Goff's comments at H, at the bottom of 248, and over the page. We say these sorts of communications in ex parte Francis are exactly the sort of communications that were contemplated in Cox and Railton, <coughs> whose immediate object isn't the carrying out of the fraud, but they still affect the accomplishment of the fraud. Um, my lords, obviously, if you read, coming back to the, my learned friend's approach, if you read Barifan in a, in a restricted way. Sorry. Sorry. They're, not, they're not in furtherance of the fraud, but they do affect the accomplishment of the fraud. That was the They, well, they weren't created, obviously, by the authors with any kind of that sort of purpose. They are created, in that sense, innocent, uh, innocently. But they affect the accomplishment of the fraud, or are part of the continuing fraud, the point that Lord Goff makes about the purpose of the bank, robber isn't just to rob a bank. So it's continuing... It's continuing the original iniquitous purpose. Yes. So it is for the furtherance of that purpose. I'm not sure yes, I just myself why you say this, My this Lord illustrates right. a distinction between in furtherance... Of I, I think Lord, Lord Goff's formulation shows... Um, <coughs> well, hey, it shows different courts use different... Really. He's using... Furtherance is one of a trio of, well, actually, I think it's, it's preparation is one, and then furtherance or part of is other. But you're, you, for, there's a risk that we're using furtherance as an omnium gatherum phrase uh, in a very broad sense, yeah. um, uh, or as a rather particular thing, which is how Lord uh, Mr. Justice Goff appears to have seen it. Uh, and that shouldn't be a problem as long as we're clear how you're using it at any particular time. You're right. We I do need to be careful. Care. Yes, I, I hear what my lords say, and you're right that at times, in furtherance is used on both sides as the sort of catch-all phrase. But but you're right. I don't mean it in that in, in, a, in a narrow sense. Well, Lord Goff, as distinct from Mr. Justice Goff, and they, were, <laughs> they were of course different people. Um, is using furtherance oh, in a sufficiently yeah. broad sense. I hadn't picked it up. That it covers also preparation and um, part of. Um, my lords, can we go next to Barclays Bank and Eustace, which is uh, behind tab 15, page 295. Uh, you may this is a case concerning section 423 of the Insolvency Act. The claimant bank sought declarations seeking to set aside transactions on the grounds they were transactions of an undervalue. Um, the claimant alleged that the defendant had entered into transactions with family members at a time the defendant knew that proceedings by the bank were imminent. 
the transactions prejudice the bank's position by removing assets from the reach of the bank. Um, now, just to say, in one respect, this is regarded in some of the leading texts as a controversial decision, insofar as it appears to extend the traditional crime fraud exception to cases where conduct falls short of dishonesty. And I think it, everyone generally recognises, albeit the term was used by Lord Justice Bingham in Venturas and Mountain and in other earlier cases, the, this term, idea of calling this the iniquity exception has come broadly from, from this case. That said, that controversy about how, <coughs> what, how far does the, the exception extend doesn't have relevance in this case before us for the reasons I gave you at the beginning. But I do rely on the decision, not for what it says about the type of conduct that can be caught, but for the general approach of the court in determining whether the exception uh, is engaged. And it's this, the point I want to make really about the two stages. One starts with looking at, at the, whether the iniquity has been made out, and you see the court um, addressing that first in Lord Justice Schumann's judgment, page 301 of the bundle, was the transaction entered into as an undervalue? And then, having determined that in the bank's favour, they then come to consider whether privilege attaches to the communications in question. Uh, and you see that at page 305. <clears throat> now, could I then ask you to turn to page 308? Where, uh, which recalls the submissions of Mr. Morgan on behalf of uh, the claimant as to why privilege shouldn't be lifted. If you wouldn't mind looking at letters E to F that are underlined there, that are sidelined there. And there's a reference at um, 305 to strong prima facie case, but not to say that that's, to, that's the test, just to say that there is one. Yes. So just the sideline passage. Just to look at the, the submission, because I want to then take you over the page. Oh, I'm where, so sorry. Where do I find the submission then? 308. It's the bit that's sidelined. Perhaps on the wrong page. That's fine. Yes, I see. Give me a moment. turn over the page when I was to see why Lord Justice <coughs> Schumann rejects the, that submission. Again, if you could read the passage that is sidelined. Well, so that helpfully encapsulates how the exception will fall to be applied in an innocent solicitor case. There obviously doesn't need to be anything overt on the face of the documents which evidences the iniquitous purpose. And we say the key is to assess whether the iniquitous purpose is made out. And once there is, and if there's been involvement by the solicitor in fulfilling that iniquity, then it's likely that a broad uh, group of communications will be caught by it. My Lord's last case in this bundle I want to look at is Dubai Aluminium, page uh, tab 17, page 338. My Lord, this is a case in which the, claim, the plaintiff had employed private investigators, Page Associates, as it happens, the same Mr. Page who features in this litigation, to obtain information about the defendant, Mr. Alawi, uh, it was found to be in breach of Data Protection Act. Uh, and Swiss banking laws. 
And this is obviously the case that we rely on, from which we adopted our formulation of the order. And just to take you very briefly to QPAS, it's not a long judgment, but on page 342, the underlying passage, uh, you'll see Mr. Justice Rick's found there was, a, there was strong prima facie evidence that the plaintiff's advisors had obtained information in breach of the Data Protection Act and Swiss banking rules. So that was obviously focusing very much on the first... Sorry, sorry I was just behind you. Which, which page? 342. Which, which? The, the first part of London sideline bit, C to E. Yeah, okay. But again, that's just his description of the evidence. There wasn't any argument in that case about what the test should be. No, there wasn't. Isn't it? It's temporary judgment. Sorry, I'm not. Um, sorry, it doesn't ma matter. <laughs> it's puzzled, but I wonder whether it's, an, it's temporary judgment. It doesn't matter. Um, it's more that I'm, I'm not a re relying on this one about anything to do with the, the test, but more the approach that he, he concluded that the, uh, that the first limb was satisfied, and then he had no difficulty in then ordering that the privileged documents generated by or reporting on that iniquity were caught by the exception. And the, the other point I wanted to pick up here is you'll see at the beginning of that paragraph, uh, the passage that I asked you to look at, when he says this evidence is not answered on behalf of Dubai. And you'll see on the previous page in the underlined passage, there's a reference to no explanation having been provided as to how the information had been obtained. So, so we rely on that as a point that actually non-admissions and non-answering evidence is one of the uh, strands, if you like, that your lordships can take into account when deciding whether I've met my evidential burden. And the test that Mr. Justice Rick was applying is, is it that was set out on page 1966, letter E to A, the Lord Sumner and the Lord Gravity. Yes. The test which he describes as the, that's a well established doctrine in the course of or in furtherance of. Yes. We've seen referred to in a number of the cases that we haven't yet. Yes, so I'm rather regretting not having taken that too first, but I'm going to plow on. Um, well, even we have to take some notice of what you have in this. Uh, I, I, I am, you will understand when I come to it, I want to, there are particular statements in it about the evidence that you, that you can take into account in the various strands, but one of the points picked up in this case is that a, a non-admission and simply not answering the evidence may be something that you can, you can take into account. Um, my Lords, one point, you can put that file away. Let's just take you very quickly to uh, Queen and Gibbons, second volume behind tab 23. Um, like Butler and Board of Trade, this is another case that was just concerned with a single document. Um, Mr. Gibbons, in this case, was seeking a ruling under PACE that instructions to counsel prepared by his solicitor and annotated by him should be excluded as evidence uh, in the criminal trial on the grounds that they were privileged. Um, and that document, these instructions to counsel, had come into the police's possession as a result of the issue of a production order. So everyone, again, knew the contents uh, of that uh, document. And the Court of Appeal accepted, as in Butler, that there were the two questions which had to be satisfied. And you see that at page uh, 470, at paragraph 49, at the end of that paragraph, that there are those two questions. Now, the debate in this case surrounded what the evidential standard should be for the second limb. Uh, Mr. Gibbons argued that the second question needed to be satisfied to a criminal standard of proof. Uh, which the Court of Appeal rejected and said, no, it's, it's the same for both limbs. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is, is a, again, the Court's approach about assessing the two limbs. Quite Sorry, apart. Just, just one second. Yeah. I'm just reading paragraph 50. Right. 
Right. Um, Sorry, do you go on? The point I wanted to take, first of all, is paragraph 43, which is on page 468. The two questions. Um, the court says, uh, while the questions, the questions which the court must ask itself are conveniently split into two, the court may look at the position in the round, including the contents of the documents of which disclosure uh, is sought. And then, more importantly, if you turn over to pa paragraph 47, the first five lines, I just ask you to read those. Yes? Then what, the, the point I rely on this for is that... Um, an approach where one just looks at the face of the documents and tries to work out whether there are further instances of the fraud or not simply by what they say on, on their face isn't sufficient because one needs to look at the wider context. Um, <coughs> and here um, the Court of Appeal notes that usually it's going to require consideration of the contents of the documents in the wider context. So that's what I take from, from this uh, authority. Well, you get here and at 49, at uh, least an explanation of what Lord Justice Potter means by a prima facie case, i.e. that which appears to be the position at the time of consideration in the absence of further explanation. Yes, thank you. Um, my Lord, I'm conscious of the time. I just, if I may... Well, are you where you thought you would be at this time? Um, almost. Perhaps John a little later, so as the, I haven't asked my lords this, but unless they kick me under the table, you want to take us to another case before we rise, just to make sure we're a bit more comfortable for time tomorrow, that's fine by us. Um, Possibly want to stop now, that's fine no, as well. My lords, I would like to, um, I, I may come back. I'm conscious that I haven't gone to a Blyazov, although my lords are just a problem, maybe familiar with it. I'm going to leave that and I want, if I may, in just five more minutes if I can... So you're going to leave what? I mean, you're coming back, there's plenty of authorities you haven't taken us to yet, no. but you're doing them in a particular structure. I am, and okay. I'm not going to go to all of them because I can't in the time available. No, but I, I would be very surprised if you're not going to take it. You are, you've promised to take us to... Uh, O'Rourke. O'Rourke and to Abliazov, presumably. I will come, ba I will, I will come back to uh, Abliazov, but I want to, if I'm... And you'll see reason why, why I... I would like to. No, I don't, don't mind. As long as we have time for some time, you do your own structure. What do you want to do now in the five minutes? I want to minutes? just, if I may, talk to you about the evidence for five minutes, and then it'll become apparent why. Um, I need to convince my lords. I, we've, we've accepted to a very strong prima facie case, but whatever that might mean, we need to convince you uh, that we have met and discharged that burden. Now, there is a lot of material that we rely upon uh, in support of our submission that we are able to discharge that burden, that the judge was wrong to find otherwise. I cannot realistically take the court to all of that material. So what I propose to do is to provide, uh, with your Lord, it's indulgent, a note which we've prepared that gives the references and extracts of the evidence that we rely upon under each head. Can I just say something about this document, if you're willing to accept it, which I'll hand up? Well, why not hand it up first? We'll tell you whether we're prepared to accept it. But if you want to talk about it, we haven't even seen what it is. I think that would be confusing to us. Um, can I? I will. Can I make right. five points? All right. First of all, it's intended to assist and to be more helpful than simply providing you with a list of references for you to follow up. It is effectively the synthesis of what I would have gone through orally if time allowed. There is nothing new in this document. It's simply pulling together the submissions we made below, the references from the pleadings, the evidence, and the skeletons, and including now the further evidence. It is not, you'll see, it's not a further skeleton, and it's therefore intended to assist your lordships. I'd also say this is very similar to the... Sorry, are you, are you said five points. This is all the first points, is it? I haven't even separated them out. Oh, anymore. sorry. I'm, I'm just going through them. Because I don't I'm, mind at all. If you say five points, I tend to write down one, two, three, four. Uh, no, don't okay. worry. Okay, keep going. Where, 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 where are we going? Have you, Mr. Eady has seen this, has he? He hasn't seen it. He no, hasn't because seen I've, it. he hasn't seen it because it's, I've prepared it over the course of preparing my submissions 
over this weekend and this morning when it became apparent I couldn't possibly get through everything. Can I say, on, the, on this point that my Lord's just raised, it is similar to the approach that was taken before the Court of Appeal in SFO and ENRC, where I appeared for ENRC. We needed to show that contrary to the findings of the judge, it had discharged its evidential burden in establishing reasonable contemplation of litigation. Um, and you see reference in the judgment of ENRC, tab 38, uh, page 984, paragraph 86. And we're talking we, about, I, I feel quite strongly on these points, that if you're going to seek to introduce something new, you should give it to your opponent at the earliest possible opportunity, uh, which was certainly before you started speaking today. It may be that Mr. E.D. is perfectly content for you to hand it up, in which case we don't need to spend all this time you're spending and making submissions as to why we should receive it. But speaking for myself, I'm not sure this is a very good use of the court's time. Well, shall I hand it across and hand it... Um... Why not hand it to everybody? I imagine you're not going to... I mean, well, hand it to everybody now, at least so we can see what kind of a thing it is. Then it would be easier for us to decide how to handle it. So for how you introduced it, I thought we'd just have a list of references, but this is a 25-page well, document with lots of text. Well, I can produce another version, which is simply the references, if, you're, if my lords would prefer. Well, what are you, how are you proposing to use this document? Do you propose to hand it in and move on and make us read it well, sometime of our choice? Well, I will, I will highlight choice? a few points, but going through, taking you through all the references would take me half a day, if not a day, to go through them. I'm not sure... I, I have a burden to discharge of a strong prima facie case. I have to give you the material to say how it is. But it's already it's there true. in the evidence. Well, it is. But if it isn't there, you're in trouble. And if it is there, it, you take us to your best points and say, and here are some further references which I can't, in the time available, well, um, uh, take you to, which would be a conventional way of dealing with it. It, it is, and of course that's... Um, that is what it is doing, is, is simply lifting out the references of everything we said below. I'm also in difficulty that you see none of you see none of this material, no assessment that's happened in the judgment, because the judge, uh, as it were, decided he just didn't need to address or analyse the But you were given a, a 45 page skeleton argument, more than usual, in which these sorts of things could have been, um, well, this sort of exercise could have been done. Look. Uh, Maybe my lords want to ask some more questions about it. My inclination would be that we will go out for a few minutes now and uh, reach at least a provisional view about how we want to handle this. That will also give Mr. Eady some time. It may be we say they really ought to think about it more overnight, but let's have a first look at it now. Is there anything you feel like we've got to say, you'd like to say before yes. we even go out and yes. look I, at I've it? Yes, I've got to address you on two... Uh, other grounds of appeal, one of which on the point about victim, whether victim can claim privilege has a huge amount of law to take you through. Um, I've got to take you through the evidence on the litigation privilege. I've got to take you to all the further evidence on legal advice privilege. I'm, I, I cannot see how I can deal with all of the aspects of my appeal that I need to, particularly on something document heavy on, on establishing this strong prima facie case, without providing you with a document. Now, I did consider simply providing something shorter, which required was a list simply of references. I didn't think that would be a great assistance. I, I reiterate what I said before. There isn't anything new. It's just pulling it all together in yeah. one place. Well, you are a repeat. You may be, for all I know, pushing at an open door. I don't know. It seems silly to hear submissions about it till we've had a chance to have a look at I, it. I understand it. So that's what I'm suggesting. We will rise for five right. minutes, or it might be ten, but it won't be much longer than that given the time of the afternoon. We will at least see what it is. 
And if we have a strong provisional view, we'll tell you what it is. And if we don't, um, we'll have to sort this out in the morning. My Lord, I hear that. One, one more thing. Can I ask if you are not willing to accept it, how it is you would like to be addressed on the issues? Because I obviously can't take you to those. So I cannot be left in a position where well, you've got an hour a, a day and you've decided how, how to... I'd have to not address you on some of my other grounds. Well, advocates have these difficulties and they decide how to cut their coat according to their cloth. And you have produced a method, which I'm not saying is wrong, this took me by surprise, uh, the kind of document it was. And if you don't do that, you'll have to find something else, to, some other way. If we don't allow you to do it this way, you'll have to do it some other way. Um, but. This is all premature until we've had a chance to look at it. Thank you. Can I just say, say this? Um, I think it's implicit in what your Lordship already said. I will get a chance to comment on this because we've obviously been dealing with completely by the time. Um, Quite. Well, I, I think well, all, the first phase is for us all to have a proper look at it. Let's see what it is. And I think it is sensible to do at least that uh, shortly now. But the more we go on talking about it, the longer time will go on.
Uh, well, Ms. Lopez, um, you will have gathered that we were uh, somewhat taken back and we remain concerned at admitting a document of uh, this kind uh, at this stage. Uh, we're not going to take a definitive decision about it. It's too late to do that. Uh, we, uh, you will have to, uh, we will in the morning hear what Mr. Edie's position about it is. Uh, and uh, uh, you may have the chance, you, you will have the chance to, to respond. Uh, but I think you must proceed on the assumption or the basis that you may not be allowed to admit it and should have a plan B ready as to how you're going to structure your submissions tomorrow. Uh, it may be that a much shorter document simply giving references will be a very helpful um, uh, material for us. But uh, it's really up to you how you, uh, how you handle it, but you can't assume that this will be admitted. Uh, now, the... Uh, other point, uh, in the course of your submissions, my Lord raised a point about uh, the prima facie, strong prima facie uh, test, and the, uh, that remains something that we are interested in, whether it will actually be an issue in the appeal, it may be another matter, but this is an important, maybe an important judgment, and we want whatever <coughs> help either party uh, can give us about it. So. Uh, if um, uh, you may have one or two other things to be thinking about tonight, but uh, you're a team, uh, uh, if some thought can be given to that aspect as well, likewise on Mr. Edie's side, uh, and um, uh, a couple of points my Lord might want, wish us to make by way of amplification, but what we require help on. Thank you. 